what he's thinking is, if I can do a little bit more, show people just that little bit more what we are trying to do for them to mm. improve the dire economic situation, try to boost a bit of growth, this inflation thing is coming down, potentially, hopefully interest rates are going to go down. Uh, every little thing that I can do, show people that we're doing something about childcare, will hopefully drag it back mm. ever so slightly. Mm. You know, in a way, he's he's doing the right thing, in that if he wants to keep improve on, things... Keep on keeping on. Yeah, keep on keeping on, and, and, you know, try to kind of suppress the internal rows that are going on in the Conservative Party about this fear and this panic about the polls, etc. That's all he can do, and essentially just wait for what he eventually decides is, well, this is maybe the moment of least damage yeah. to call this election, I mean, that mean that we might lose, you know, the kind of lowest... Uh, the, the 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 least number of seats to lose essentially. Yeah, Joe, if you were if you were in the room, which you might you well might have been, what would you have been saying, or what would you be saying to Rishi Sunak now, just to keep him keeping on? God, it's like the worst job in history to be offered, John. Um, I don't I don't know that there is anything in particular to, to say. I don't think there is a, a great deal more that that he can do than he is doing. I. I still have my doubts that the pledges that were picked are the right pledges. Um, I think the whole point about, you know, sticking with the plan and, and trying to minimise the losses. But when you look at the numbers that we're talking about, it really is deck chairs and Titanic kind of moment. It's mm. not, we're not really looking at, at any significant numbers that are going to be saved. The only thing that this kind of poll tells him is that actually some of the people that might have been vying for the job might have a bit of a fight of their own on, on their hands rather than worrying about the top job. So to some extent, I think I've always assumed, my working assumption, uh, to use the Prime Minister's phrase, is that it's going to be a 14th of November or the 21st of November election. I thought it was going to be late. I thought they'd call it straight after the, the um, conferences. But why would you go any sooner? Given how bad it's looking, you have absolutely got to throw everything and the kitchen sink and some at this because you have no chance of winning anything anytime soon. So mm. even if, and ultimately, even if you are going to lose, you, you're absolutely right, Milo, like you, you, you don't want to lose as badly as some of these polls are suggesting. He is right. The only poll that counts is polling day. That's the thing we always say as, you know, as strategists in what I do. But ultimately, um, you also have to have done everything you can do. You have to be looking at, you know, focus groups and, and what exactly the conversation is out there. The yes. biggest problem I think Rishi's had is that the conversation is being knocked off course constantly. There is so much other news going on that it's really hard to keep a handle on the narrative. Yes, yes. I mean, I don't know, we got this text in from our listener, Mike. He says, John, a Labour result like 1997, my goodness, are we going to be disappointed afterwards? I mean, look, if, if Keir Starmer was, was anywhere near, he'd be saying, look, we're not complacent, it's not over to the table, we're going to fight for every vote, and so on and so on and so on. But he wouldn't be human if he wasn't thinking, look, I've pretty much got this in the bag. And if he's thinking that, he has got to be somewhere, at least two brain cells at the back of his head, haunted by what he's going to inherit and the problem of starting to deliver and meet up the expectations, low as they are, well, if, I he, thought, if he comes into, into office. I thought that was... I mean, I, I wondered why anyone wanted the job when Rishi was going for it in the first place, because I thought it's pretty dire and you've got such a short amount of time to do anything and no money with which to do it to do anything as well that it's it's got to be pretty grim so you're you're sort of a caretaker over a pretty miserable period yeah. and i think for labor you know that's exactly the problem is that they're looking thinking there is no real money to do anything particularly clever um and you know unless they do get a really big majority then some of the big structural things they want to do that will involve actually a passage of legislation through the house of commons and then the house of lords it's going to be pretty hard to pass. So they do need to get big numbers to be able to make mm. seismic changes mm. in the sort of way that they want to make. Yeah, well, except they're not contemplating seismic changes, are, are they? I mean, when it comes to, you know, we're splitting the House of to talk about reform in the, in the NHS. And yes, we know the sort of ideas he has in, has in mind. They're not going to be transformative in the output of the of the NHS anytime soon. And, and we can take that, of course, any public service. Look at the depth of the problem. Look at what's being discussed. Look at the fact that there's no money and you get very quickly to a point where the public's very low expectations are going to still turn into a sense of disappointment. And, and that now answers the, the big question about why they're not saying too much. Oh, yeah. Because ultimately, they haven't got a lot they can get people excited about. I don't know whether Great British Energy will require some form of legislation to support its passage. Mm. Some There's lots of talk about the private school VAT issue, that actually there's some legislative 
moves that will need to be made around being able to charge VAT for parents on that. There will be bits and pieces probably on workers' rights. There will be things that they will need to do. But th the bottom line is you also need big vision and you need a, the will to get this stuff done. And, mm. and the challenge will be whether they, you know, are they given enough time to even do it? Right. Let's look at this, though. And well, we've still got a moment before the news. Harry Cole of The Sun, he was in the chair, in the chair asking questions. And he asked when the last time was that the Prime Minister was on the phone to Boris Johnson. When was the last time you spoke to Boris Johnson on the phone? Uh, I don't know, actually. I spoke to him Was he going to join you on the campaign trail? I, I spoke to him in person at the end of last year, and we've messaged since then as well. Is he going to join you on the campaign trail? Are you going to share a platform? In general, what about general, Liz? Look, what about anybody, Liz? Are you going to have three of you stand any, there together? Anyone from the Conservative family who wants to see a Conservative government re-elected and doesn't think Keir Starmer is the right person to lead our country will be welcome on the campaign trail, right? Because ultimately, that's the choice. It's... Keir Starmer or me as Prime Minister after the next election. And Boris Lewis and, and Rishi. If you, if you want to keep cutting taxes, if you want a more sensible approach to net zero, if you want to tackle yeah. illegal migration, I think those are all things that your readers got, want, then we're the people who are going to that for you. I wonder, if, I wonder if he really... Joe, I wonder if he really does want to see your old boss, Boris Johnson, <laughs> uh, anywhere near him on the campaign trail, let alone Liz Truss. What do you think? Well, I wonder what David Cameron will think about it as well. Um, I mean, it's a... We've talked before about the ungovernable Tory party and we've talked about, you know, the challenges of the, the various personalities. And I can remember very clearly being on a campaign trail with Boris where he jumped up when David Cameron was out with us on, on one of the visits. I think we were in Richmond and a plane was going overhead and Boris sort of jumped up. I want to make one final point. We are going to oppose the expansion of Heathrow. And suddenly sort of David Cameron's face jaw drops and you're like, oh, here we go. And, you know, ultimately... It's hard enough to keep the show on the road, but when you've got characters like Boris, who ultimately will not have any skin in the game to help make sure that, you know, that the message is kept on track. He didn't do it when it was his own campaign and he had to keep the message <laughs> on track. He would go off on a tangent because he got a, a feeling in his gut that he should go in that direction. So, I, you know, I think it would make for a very entertaining campaign, but yeah. I certainly wouldn't want to be managing it no, by any means. Boris Johnson would do that because that's, that's just who he is. Mm. I, mean, I mean, just before we move on, I mean, there was something else in this conversation with the Prime Minister, Joe... Um, the Prime Minister's trousers, you understand that came up as well? <laughs> yeah, Harry Cole, the political editor of the Sun, asked why Rishi's trousers are so short, which I, I'm not, I actually hadn't really <laughs> noticed. What, what I, know he wore well, a, I know he wore a particular sort of hoodie a lot, but I didn't know anything about his trousers. But apparently he said, uh, he was asked the question about um, were his trousers too short? And apparently he said that he didn't think they are too short, uh, but also said that he tends not to like lots of baggy baggy stuff at the bottom of my ankle and then said, I don't think they are too short. Which I just think, I just <laughs> think does, it's though? a really he bad he, question. He'd have done terribly in the 70s, wouldn't he, Richard Simmons? <laughs> yeah, so no bell bottoms. No, uh, I know Nadine no didn't flares. like what he wore. Nadine Doris made a point about his clothes, didn't she, yeah. previously in the leadership election, but um, but I'm not sure. Obviously, maybe that's what the hipsters wear in California. Yeah, well, did he, does he, well, did he used to wander around the house wearing sort of Alibaba-type trousers, <laughs> flapping... <laughs> I mean, who knows? The mind boggles. It raises more <laughs> questions than here. The Tory party, generally branded, aren't they? The party of nimbyism, of being in favour of house building, but just not anywhere near their back backyard. Goes for Tory MPs, or not all of them, but some of them, and their, and their local councils. How fair is that, do you think? Um, it does differ across the country. I think one of the, the, the big problems has been that people have... have have ultimately... Um, local authorities have, have sort of shied away from having really big fights about uh, planning issues in their, their local areas. The, the, one of the biggest problems is how long it takes to actually get planning for things. The amount of hold-ups um, and how much it can put off builders is a huge issue. But I think one of the challenges that the Tory party have got is that they've sort of had their credibility just generally for homeowners sort of dented over what happened with Liz Truss, the sort of spike in interest rates and how you know it's it's felt very expensive that mm. even if you are on the ladder it's it's incredibly expensive to stay on it yes because people's mortgages sort of went through the roof their yes. interest rate has gone up so much so i think the problem had been that it for many people it was already out of reach to get on the housing ladder and under the tories for a lot of people it feels like it's got even worse because of what happened with with the financial markets um as the result of that period that, that liz trust was in so i think it's good fertile ground for Labour to go after. Um, I'm not sure any political party has the answers. There's been lots of sort of devolved powers to local authorities. There's lots of 
uh, powers that have gone to the metro mayors, whether actually we can see a situation where we do start building properly. It's it's very complex. There's lots of yes. issues around the housing market yes. and why it doesn't work. But it, but ultimately, we do need to see people that are able to actually get a proper roof over yeah. their head. What do you think? Uh, I mean, it's got to be a good thing that it's a live political issue anyway at election time. Absolutely, it's a good thing it's a political issue. I, I think the problem with this thing is that it's always it's so easy to make promises and so difficult to actually deliver on them with this particular yeah. thing because, yeah, basically... So many people, everyone in the country, really, depending, regardless of age, because, you know, you've got grandparents that are thinking about their grandkids getting on the housing ladder, etc. Everyone basically agrees that we need more housing in this country. But it's just when it happens, people don't like it to, generally don't like it to be near them. And so it's great to promise it and everyone at the election mm. can say, yeah, they're a great idea. But then mm. when it comes to actually doing it in practice, it's mm. it's much more difficult. And I suppose the problem for Labour is their general kind of political support centres are urban centres. You know, mm. they get a lot of support in cities, etc. In those places, yeah, potentially it's easy to build more houses. You know, you could you could make cities denser. You know, London is it's pretty pathetic, really. We've got 9 million people in, yeah. in London. There's like more than 9 million people in the second biggest city in Japan and Tokyo is like 32 million people or whatever. Like, London could be way more dense than it actually mm. is, for example. Those kind of places, Labour might have some success. But if they're looking for swing voters in more rural areas that they're trying to pick up at this election from the yeah. Conservatives, if they then start saying, well, actually, we're going to build a new housing state in your area or, you know, new housing on your street or whatever, or make your town centre a bit more dense, then they might get into local difficulties. Mm. And that's when some of these promises might end up being mm. kind of rolled back. And when it comes to London, I mean, London, in sort of crude party political terms at election time, it looks like a lost cause. And the, the, the figures, the poll we saw today... And the previous polls, the last couple of polls, they, they, they point towards London being an entirely conservative free zone, don't they? Um, and as you say, it may play down well in some of the urban areas, the, the, the towns uh, and so on. Maybe that would help motivate people to turn out as much as uh, as any, anything else. But I don't know, I mean, the perception of the, the government and the Tory party in this thing, I mean, Michael Gove, he is seen as the, being the guy who watered down those mandatory housing, house building targets, isn't he? And making planning laws or changing the planning laws so they're easier for the objectors to succeed. Yeah, and I think, and you know, when you look at the layer upon layer of challenges, it's things like, you know, you stick in a new estate, that's all very well, but then where is where is the infrastructure that supports that? And the, the ability, you know, even now, people can't get a doctor's appointment, they struggle to see some of their local public services, but actually when you start putting big numbers of housing into areas, you need the infrastructure to follow. Yeah. And we, we just don't have the sort of system mm. that actually makes that happen. We just end up with these sort of pressure points and no wonder people feel very upset about yeah. what's happening in their local area. I think it's it's far more complicated than the sort of not in my backyard. It's not yes. necessarily that they don't like how the houses look. Yeah. or It's actually a genuine fear because the state generally lets yes. them down on everything yeah. else they have to do yeah. around it. We don't just need That's, houses, we need places for the houses yeah, to be. Yeah, school places, yeah. you know, doctors, you know, hospitals that work and have capacity at their A&Es, all those things, bus services, whatever it is. Um, it, it isn't, it, it's, you know, the NIMBY stuff is, it's a really interesting label and I think it, it, you know, it's very catchy when we have these conversations, but this is about sort of... S really subsequent state failures, successive state failures, to actually get proper planning right mm. and therefore to build homes and infrastructure that means that communities can thrive. Yeah, I, th I think that's... And that's, that's where reform right. will prey on. You know, reform will, yeah. will get into that, that No, space. I think that's right. I, and I, th I think the other thing is, uh, is um, you know, let's see what the... Labour's kind of trying to make it sound like they're going to go big on this. Let's see what the actual ambition is, right? Because well, they, at the they've moment... They've got a target. They've got a one and a half million... New home target. Over they the absolutely do, but what is the Conservative target? The Conservative yeah. target is 300,000 a yeah. year. I had a, a friend of mine that supports Labour saying, oh, no, but Labour's going to do a lot for housing, 1.5 billion houses. Well, divide that by four or five years. Mm. It's exactly the same, basically, yeah. number. You know, At the moment, they are just saying they're going to do what the government is going to do. So let's see if during the election mm. campaign or closer to the election, they're actually going to change and it there and are, say we're going to do more. And there are clever things that people can do. There are clever ideas that you know reports are being published all the time about how to sort of reinvigorate high streets and actually to put more residential housing onto high streets where there is existing infrastructure because there's bus routes, there are shops, etc. So rather than, you know, every third or fourth unit being a coffee shop or a charity yeah. shop, you actually look at how you can transform some property back mm. from commercial into resi. And that mm. was something that the Conservative government were focused on doing, but I don't think they've done enough of it. Yeah, well, I guess 
again, it's an area where the where the, the, the government, the Conservative Party, couldn't be in that squeeze again. We've got Labour making these promises on one side. On the other, you've got reform. So the real problem here with shortage of housing and, for that matter, the shortage of, of places in schools, the shortage of, of, of how hard it is to get seen by your doctor or the local A&E, that's about uncontrolled immigration. And, and, and that you, is exactly that is exactly the debate that comes up every time. It's all about it's immigrants in your area that are taking away your access to those services. It's not actually about the fact that the debate is not about the fact that there are just not enough services for the number of people. I don't think it's about where those people come from. Yeah. But that is an easy area that then there's it's seen as fertile ground for some political parties to how, go. How after. then, as a, as I, I say, as a strategist, is how should the Conservative Party play this one? How do they play this hand? I think it's we're we're back to we're back to the sort of it's really the the sort of thing that's hanging around um, Rishi's neck really is this lack of delivery for such a, a significant period of the Conservative administration. Ultimately, you know, it, I don't think the public are necessarily going to buy whatever they're going to sell now because hmm. it's kind of well, why didn't you do it already? How can you suddenly come up with a bunch of new ideas when? half the people that are in number 10 have been people that have been around in Conservative administrations for several years. Why have you not adopted new thinking? Why have you not done mm. something different? It's just lots of sort of slow, sluggish... I wouldn't even call it progress. It's just a slight bit of movement towards mm. a particular policy direction. You can't really point to anything that significant that's happened that, that then anyone can hang their hats on and say, yeah, didn't we do well? We actually have made a difference somewhere. Because there just isn't... There, is, there isn't anything tangible. And I think that is, that is where, as, as long as Rishi clings on, fine... But ultimately, what are you going to go and sell to the public that they're going to buy next time? Because yeah. I just don't... That What they're really going to do at the next election is say, they're going to be worse than us. If you thought it was bad under us, are you really going to take a risk on them? And they're going to sort of have these sort of big fingers pointed at Keir Starmer and yeah. the team. And it's going to be about how much of a risk do you want to take? Let me just share what some of our listeners are thinking. Um, Nick, he says, your guests are wrong. I've told you guys. He says, the polls show the longer the PM keeps on keeping on, the worse the numbers get for him. And here's a, another regarding pledges. Pledge to national debt. Really, who cares? Pledge five, stop the boats. He says only Boris Johnson would have pledged such nonsense. It was a terrible misstep. And we'll bury Sunak. I wonder what, what are you thinking, Amelia? Well, I was going to say that. I mean, there's a very, very good point about the poll, and it's, and it's completely true. Yeah, of course, there is a sense in which, at the moment, as Rishi Sunak is waiting and hoping that things will change, yeah, the numbers do appear to slowly be getting potentially worse and worse and worse. And that's the decision that he, he, he has to make. The decision is, do I go now because I'm worried that it's going to get even worse, call an election now, hedge the bets, just, you know, get it done with, rip the plaster off, or do I wait and hope that something changes and things turn around? But, yeah, at the moment, obviously, that's the way it looks. Uh, yeah. uh, your listeners right. right. Well, you're listening to Emilio Castellicchio there and, and Joe Tanner here on Pinar and Friends. 